Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, if you can't read the screen y no entienden español, you should move forward so you can see it. Es un honor participar en este Congreso de Multilingualism 2.0, Multilingual 2.0. It's an honor to participate. And I look forward to learning a lot in the next two days. En reconocimiento de nuestro tema y del lugar en que nos encontramos, Yo voy a dar esta conferencia de manera bilingüe, en español y en inglés. Yo sé que mucha gente aquí entiende ambos idiomas, pero el texto en inglés ap aparecerá en la pantalla gracias a mi equipo técnico, aquí, Laura Gutiérrez. Um, y voy a pasar entre los dos idiomas para realmente entrar físicamente en el tema del, del multilingüismo. And this is partly an experiment of mine in, in, multicultural, in multilingual comprehension, multilingualism from the comprehension end. One of the things that fascinates me most about human language is the fact that our capacity to comprehend is infinitely greater than the capacity you have to produce in language. So I give classes in which you are not, it doesn't matter what language you speak, if you can understand English and Spanish well and read both, I don't care what language the speaking goes on in, and that opens things up to a much larger multilingual community than you have if you stick to the speech end of requirement of multilingualism. Entonces, este es un experimento en multilingüismo, la comunidad lingüística multilingüe desde la comprensión. Um, hoy recuerdo una, cosa, una ocasión, diez años atrás, cuando fui invitada a participar en un congreso sobre bilingüismo en la Universidad de Harvard, organizado por Doris Summer. Nos impresionó mucho que el presidente de Harvard, que entonces era Larry Summers, el, el no mencionado Larry Summers, <risa> nos daría la bienvenida. Dijimos, ay, que por fin eh, se está reconociendo la importancia de nuestro tema. Y así fue, pero no de la manera que anticipábamos. En vez, en vez de dar la breve, la breve bienvenida de 90 segundos, el presidente Summers nos sorprendió con un sermón de 20 minutos, diciendo lo siguiente, estoy segura, estoy seguro que ustedes llegan con las mejores intenciones del mundo, pero el tema que van a discutir así, aquí carece de interés intelectual y además es una amenaza a la sociedad. Canalizando su avatar, Samuel Huntington, Summers nos dijo, si ustedes salen con lo suyo, De aquí a 20 años, habrá dos Harvard en vez de uno. Uno que habla español y el otro inglés. Y eso será el fin de la universidad. Me acordé de ese incidente un poco extraño hace un par de semanas cuando Rick Santorum, cuando presenciamos el enorme, la enorme metida de pata de Rick Santorum en Puerto Rico. ¿Se acuerdan que que cuando le, a la pregunta inevitable si apoyaba o no la estatalización de Puerto Rico, Santorum contestó, like every other state, it must comply with this and every other federal law, and that is that English should be the principal language. Como ustedes vieron el furor que siguió. Santorum, a su turno, estaba canalizando su mentor, Newt Gingrich, quien en el contrato Contract with America en 1996 habló del bilingüismo como una amenaza a la civilización americana. Cito estas anécdotas, no solo para acordarnos que Arizona no tiene el monopolio sobre la confrontación lingüística en este país, pero también para ejemplificar El tipo de, de, la, el tipo de agresividad gratuita, eh, curiosa, ¿no? eh, que puede disparar eh, la idea del multilingüismo en el psique norteamericano, sobre todo el hecho del español. En ambos casos, el de Larry Summers y el de Rick Santorum, la agresividad estaba uncalled for, no, no tenía motivo, ¿no? Nadie le pidió a Rick Santorum que hablara de la cuestión lingüística. 
Entonces uno, 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 uno se, le ocurre, se le ocurre uno la pregunta, ¿qué convocó eso, ese, ese tipo de agresividad? ¿Qué duende llevó a, a, al presidente Summers a abusar de su papel de presidente? ¿Qué duende le llevó a Santorum a decir la única cosa que le garantizaba una derrota completa electoral en Puerto Rico? Es interesante eso. El monolingüismo en Estados Unidos opera no como una política, sino como dogma o como doctrina, ¿no? Una creencia que no responde necesariamente a los hechos y no necesita responder a los hechos. Y esa actitud, esa ceguera, eh, se resume en la famosa frase de mi título, de, atribuida siempre a, a un tejano apócrifo que habrá dicho, if English was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Es una burla y eso es muy importante, ¿no? La burra capta vividamente eh, el carácter dogmático del monolingüismo en estadounidense, ¿no? Y, y su distancia de la realidad. Es irreal que, que el inglés le sirvió a Jesús, obviamente el inglés ni existía. Y eso es lo que llamo yo el punto ciego de la lengua, the language blind spot en Estados Unidos. El, el gramo de autoburla en esa frase, if English was good enough for Jesus, el gramo de autoburla allí me da un gramo de esperanza. Que pueda allí haber allí todavía una apertura hacia un, una, una, una conversación más honesta acerca de la lengua en Estados Unidos, que evite toda la violencia epistémica eh, y, y social que trae el, el, la doctrina del monolingüismo. En estos pocos minutos, que van a ser como 45, eh, quiero tocar en el, algunos de lo que veo yo como los puntos de, de presión o de tensión o de fricción alrededor del multilingüismo en Estados Unidos, los puntos de desencuentro eh, entre imaginación y realidad, que, la, la, los puntos que producen la locura y la mala fe alrededor de la lengua del multilingüismo. Extenderé mi visión hacia las Américas en su totalidad, tocaré y tocaré un poco en la zona fronteriza en que, nos estamos, en que estamos ubicados ahora, en la migración, en la cuestión del colonialismo, del imperio y los contornos de la lingüística moderna. Algo de lo que voy a, que voy a decir no será nuevo para todos ustedes, pero espero que no todos. Larry Summers y Rick Santorum no desconocen el multilingüismo. Los, los, los abuelos maternos de Larry Summers fueron judíos romanos que emigraron de Europa eh, eh, alrededor de los años 20, probablemente hablando romano y yiddish. El, el padre de Santorum fue italiano, emigró a Estados Unidos de Italia en 1930 a la edad de siete años. Ambos hombres entonces crecieron en familias que estaban viviendo una experiencia que produce multitudes de norteamericanos monolingües, la pérdida de lenguas, la interrupción de la transmisión de lenguas entre generaciones mayores y menores, ¿no? eh, a través de las generaciones. Los Estados Unidos está lleno de familias en las cuales las generaciones mayores y menores no pueden conversar plenamente, donde no pueden desarrollar relaciones complejas los unos con los otros y que sufren por ello. En un momento de triunfalismo, hace unos años, Nathan Glazer dijo que la, las lenguas inmigrantes en Estados Unidos shriveled in the light of, in the air of freedom, while they had apparently flourished under adversity in Europe. O sea, el multilingüismo está equivale a la, a la adversidad. That es, es, ese cuento triunfalista de aprender inglés y salir adelante no es falso, pero lleva adentro la historia también de la pérdida lingüística que la gente muchas veces recuerda con angustia, con tristeza, con rabia, a veces con envidia por los que pudieron tomar el camino bilingüe. En este punto de la pérdida de lenguas coinciden la experiencia de los pueblos indígenas en Estados Unidos y los grupos inmigrantes. El dolor de lengua, language pain, que es lo que yo he llegado a llamarlo, 
El dolor de lengua, creo yo, es una de las fuentes importantes de la locura alrededor del lenguaje en Estados Unidos, sobre todo por la manera en que lo silenciamos. Dije que Larry Summers estaba canalizando su colega Samuel Huntington, pero fue claro, obviamente, fue Teddy Roosevelt el que consagró el, la doctrina monolingüista en Estados Unidos. Eh, dijo en 1919, tres días antes de morirse, dijo en una carta a la, a la American Defense Society que we, we have room for but one language here, and that is the English language, and we have but room for one sole loyalty, and that is loyalty to the American people. Lengua y lealtad, es una conjugación poderosa, venenosa. Inglés dijo en, un, en un, un, un artículo famoso en el Kansas City Star, debe ser la uni, el único idioma que se enseña y, o que se usa en las escuelas públicas en el país. Sigue, en inglés lo digo. We should insist that if the, that, that if the immigrant comes here in good faith, en buena fe, becomes an American and assimilates himself to us, he shall be treated on an exact equality with everyone else, for it is an outrage to discriminate against any such man because of creed or birthplace or origin. But this is predicated upon the man's becoming in very fact an American and nothing but an American. There can be no divided allegiance here. Any man who says he is an American but something else also isn't an American at all. Es una postura bastante radical. El monolingüismo en inglés está codificado aquí como la manifestación externa de la lealtad. El bilingüismo o multilingüismo se convierte en la manifestación externa de lealtades divididas, que, parafraseando a Roosevelt, no es no loyalty at all. Y esa lealtad monolingüe es la condición del derecho a la igualdad en esta cita de Roosevelt. Sin ella, sin ello, la discriminación deja de ser un ultraje. ¿sí? Roosevelt escribía en el contexto de una fase muy particular en la historia del multilingüismo en Estados Unidos. En 1890, 82% de los migrantes de Estados Unidos venían del norte de Europa y de Occidente, de Europa Occidental. Entre 1900 y 1920, los de, la demografía cambió. 60% de la gente que llegaba, llegaba de países del central y del sur de Europa, de países más sureños, trayendo una nueva ronda de, de diversidad y de, extraño, de extrañeza. Al mismo tiempo, la Primera Guerra Mundial había convertido el alemán que era el segundo, del segundo idioma más normalizado en este país, en una amenaza interna. Por todos los Estados Unidos hubo intentos de prohibir la escolarización en alemán, las, las misas religiosas, los libros de bibliotecas en alemán, los nombres de calles, los apellidos, el uso del alemán en los asuntos públicos o los espacios públicos, y todo, todos esos fueron hechos cotidianos en Estados Unidos antes de la guerra. En el Midwest y en Pensilvania era común que los pueblos vivieran bilingüe, de manera bilingüe en, en, el, en alemán e inglés, tal cual como hacemos ahora en español y en inglés. Y en el, como en el caso del español, el alemán llegó a ser una amenaza, no porque estaba fuera de lugar en Estados Unidos, sino porque no estaba fuera de lugar. No era ya una lengua extranjera, aquí, aquí vivía, aquí se reproducía. Pero en 1918-19, por ejemplo, el gobernador de Iowa eh, publicó una proclamación Babel prohibiendo todo idioma extranjero de, de las escuelas públicas y de los espacios públicos de Iowa, y Nebraska prohibió toda instrucción en idiomas que no fueran el inglés. Estas propuestas encontraron también una vigorosa oposición, como igual que hoy. ¿no? 
terminada la guerra, pleitos sobre derechos lingüísticos empezaron enseguida a llegar a las cortes en las Estados Unidos y en esos casos el multilingüismo normalmente ganaba. La Corte Suprema, por ejemplo, invalidó la prohibición de Nebraska en 1923 y las comunidades en Texas ganaron el derecho de seguir educando a sus hijos en alemán y en inglés en sus escuelas públicas. Sin embargo, obviamente, el alemán nunca recuperó su estatus como el segundo idioma de, la vida, de vida pública en Estados Unidos. Tampoco desapareció el Ethan, a pesar de Roosevelt. En el censo del año 2000 en este país, 26% de la población white non-hispanic se declaró alemán americano. Me parece fascinante. El manifiesto monolingüista de Roosevelt responde en una manera perversa a una realidad fundamental del esta de Estados Unidos. Los Estados Unidos construyen su economía importando mano de obra, saberes y sabidurías de otras partes del mundo. Lleva 40, 40, 400 años haciendo eso por toda una variedad de mecanismos, la esclavitud, el peonaje, eh, las políticas de puerta abierta, los programas de braceros, programas de refugiados, visas y becas de, para estudiantes, sponsorships, programas de visas pa, eh, para especialistas o programas de entrenamiento y claro, el enorme sistema de mano de obra indocumentada. La importación de gente y de sus capacidades es, eh, me, me parece, el mecanismo por el cual Estados Unidos se construye como economía y como sociedad. Y es tan cierto hoy que hace 200 años. En, en los años 1870, 128 mil ciudadanos chinos emigraron a Estados Unidos y en 2010 fueron un millón y medio. Esta estrategia necesariamente establece el multilingüismo como una condición sistémica, constitutiva y permanente de la sociedad estadounidense. Cuando un grupo se establece, aprende inglés, se, se bilingüe, se bilingüiza, otro, otra onda llega de otra parte, introduciendo otro, otro grupo de idiomas, de religiones, etc. ¿no? La ideología, la doctrina monolingüista trata ese hecho como un fenómeno puramente contingente, colateral, no como algo con relación a la cual el, la, el Estado tiene una responsabilidad. No lo ve como una característica sistemática y constitutiva de lo que es esta sociedad. Se ve como una cosa colateral que hay que eliminar. Ese desconocimiento me parece que es otra fuente muy importante de la mala fe de nuestro monolingüismo en este país. La teoría lingüística tampoco nos ha ayudado mucho para captar el multilingüismo. El ideal de lengua y ciudadanía que Roosevelt tenía en su mente fue, o quiero sugerir que fue, articulado en, una, en un dibujo muy famoso que apareció casi al mismo tiempo que su manifiesto monolingüista. En el, en el texto fundador de, de la lingüística moderna, que, que también fue mencionado por mi colega anteriormente, en el texto fundacional de la lingüística moderna, el cours de la lingüística general de Fernando de, so de Fernando de Saussure, que apareció en 1915. ¿Quieres poner el primer, la primera figura? Ahí está. Paso al inglés. This is Saussure's diagram of what he called in French le circuit de la parole, the circuit of speech. The act of speech, he says, of parole, of speaking, assumes at least two individuals, deux individus, he says in French. Apparently, no one talks to themselves in Saussure. I am the main counterexample. <laughs> in, this, in this picture, the way it works, as he explains it, is con this is A, this is B. Concepts reside in A's brain, 
They are associated with the linguistic signs or sound images, acoustic images, that serve to express them. A's brain transmits to A's speech organs uh, the impulse correlating to that image. And the sound waves emerge from A's mouth and they pass over to B's ear. And the circuit repeats itself in B's body in reverse order, transmitting the acoustic image from B's ear to B's brain where it is again reassociated with the concept. Let's ponder this drawing a little more. The two figures are an interesting combination of markings and absence of markings. They are identical in appearance. They're Caucasian. They're generically male, young. Their expressions are serious but calm. Their eyes are open. They are looking straight at each other, suggesting equality of rank. They are, ha they are unclothed, even hairless. They bear no marks of class, religion, place, livelihood. No surroundings define where they are. They have no bodies. Language operates identically and symmetrically between them. Only one language is in play in the situation, and it is identically shared between them. You've probably guessed where I'm going with this. I want to suggest that Saussure's two individuals here are the figure of modern liberal democratic citizenship that Roosevelt was, con was committed to. Fraternally bonded, rational, rights-bearing individual citizens, white male, in exact equality, as Roosevelt put it in his manifesto. Their visual identicalness here indexicalizes the rela a relation of equivalence and equality in relation to each other and in relation to the language. So Sur models the circuit of, of the, le circuit de la parole, the circuit of, of speech, as a symmetrical, reciprocal, and reversible exchange between equals in which equivalence implies equality and equity. The identicalness of the two visualizes the idea that A's chain of signification will be reversed, will be reproduced inversely but exactly, identically in B's brain. Modern linguistics, it appears, was founded on the principles of liberalism. Let, I want to juxtapose Saussure's drawing with another depiction of a speech situation, the, a drawing made exactly 300 years earlier in a work by an Andean indigenous writer from colonial Peru. This is from Juan Poma de Ayala's book, New Chronicle of Good Government and Justice, Nueva Crónica de Buen Gobierno y Justicia, a 1,200-page work completed in 1615, it's actually the date's wrong up there, and discovered in the Royal Library of Copenhagen in the early 1900s. The book includes a ferocious critique of Spanish colonialism as it had unfolded in Peru in, in the Andes in the 16th century. The drawing here, this is one of 400 drawings in the book. It's titled Mala Confesión, Bad or Evil Confession. The caption reads, and it's up here in English, Mala Confesión que hacen los padres y curas de las doctrinas. Aporrea las indias preñadas y a las vejitas y a indias y a las dichas solteras no las quiere confesar de edad de 20 años, no se confiesa ni hay remedio de ellas. The circuit of speech here is as follows. An unmarried indigenous woman who has been impregnated by a priest wishes to confess to gain absolution. The priest kicks her away, refusing to confess her sin, which is his. This, or so the text implies, keeps her sexually available to him and prevents her from spelling out his sin in her confession. From the standpoint of liberalism, Waman Foma's drawing depicts everything Saussure sought to dispel. We see two individuals, again, joined in multifaceted relations of hierarchy, inequality, passion, and violence. They are differentiated by gender, by race, by culture, 
by age, by status, education, livelihood, emotional state. The drawing marks all of these differences on their bodies. An institutional setting is also present. The point of commonality that brings them together here is Catholicism, which is also the arbiter of their differences. The speech act involved confession is predicated on an asymmetry of power. One has the power to give or withhold absolution. The other has the power to ask or beg. There is no reciprocity or reversibility in this circuit de parole. There is despair, violence, lust, rape, and malafé, and multilingualism. The two are native speakers of different, wholly unrelated languages. The acoustic signals passing between them will not be identical. They will be marked by their social and historical differences. Three languages are in play, likely distributed as follows. The priest is a native speaker of Spanish and is literate in it as well as in Latin. He may have sufficient mastery of Quechua to preach and receive confession as the Spanish church encouraged. The woman is a native speaker of Quechua, which was also the native language of the author, which is why his Spanish is so marked by um, not being a native speaker. She may know some Spanish or none, and she is not literate. Her access to the doctrines that bind her body and soul run through the priest, runs through the priest who does not administer them in her interest. But she also inhabits an Andean history, cosmology, ecology, and social world to which he has little access. Both probably understand more of each other's language than they can speak. Through the lens of liberalism, Wamanpoma's drawing makes sense as a figure of illib the illiberal, of illiberal, non-secular, pre-modern absolutism in its multilingual, racialized, colonial form. And many of us here would immediately find it legible in that way. On the other hand, if time could be reversed, probably the first thing Juan Poma would say about Saussure's drawing is, it's not finished, it's utterly incomplete. The people have no bodies, few social markings, there's no settings. Without these things, A and B, in fact, can have no idea what, if anything, they can or should say to each other and how they will be understood by one another. What is going on below their necks? Is A holding a knife to B's chest? Are their arms around each other's waists? Such a picture, Waman Poma would probably say, this of Saussure's picture, can tell us nothing at all about how language operates either in the world or in the brain. As it happens, that's pretty much what the French theorists Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari said in, in the 1980s in their wholesale critique of modern linguistics. Interlocution, they said, is a site for the contest of forces, not the cooperative exchange of information. Flip and Sunday, Larry Summers, I want to look at what you were thinking. The building, brick, the building brick of language, they say, is not the predicative sentence, the assertion, but the slogan, the mot d'ordre, the word of command, the violence of interpolation, where speaker put, each speaker puts the other speaker in the place they want them to, to locate them. In other words, the difference between the two drawings is to a great extent a, the difference between two conceptions of language. Notice there is nothing dated about the social order that Wamanpoma is depicting in his drawing. The Catholic Church is in upheaval today over precisely the behavior that is depicted in 1615. Scholars of racism have shown how interpolation is the set, putting someone in their place, is the central mechanism for producing injury in language. It's the, that's the, our theory around hate speech. If you're one of nearly three million people living in a prison in America, you inhabit Waman Foma's social pattern, paradigm, more than Saussure's. Keeping bodies and markings out of the picture, it seems, was Saussure's way of keeping hierarchy, difference, desire, 
the contest, the contest of forces out of the picture in order to naturalize those relations of equity and reciprocity that are his social ideal. Deleuze and Guattari aspire to reveal the willful blindness, the language blind spot in this, in this um, that this requires. In other words, modern linguistics has had its own language blind spot and its own share of mon monolinguist malafé. There lies part of the challenge for a critical multilingualism project. El factor principal que estaba omnipresente para Guaman Poma y fu completamente fuera de escena para los Saussure fue, obviamente, el colonialismo. El legado del colonialismo y del imperio, la fuerza que ahora los críticos llamamos la colonialidad, es un factor absolutamente esencial para comprender la carga, el furor, la furia alrededor del multilingüismo en las Américas, aún hoy y sobre todo hoy y aquí también. Para abarcar este tema vasto y complejo, quiero contar una historia que ocurrió, que remite a Huaman Poma, pero que hace eco con eventos que están ocurriendo también aquí y ahora. En abril de 2009, en Perú, una controversia estalló alrededor de una persona que es descendiente directa de la mujer en el dibujo de Huaman Poma. ¿Quieres pasar al, a la próxima? Hilaria Supa, miembro del Congreso peruano elegida. ¿no? Supa es una líder política de larga trayectoria en el Perú, delegada frecuente a las Naciones Unidas, hablante nativa del Quechua y una persona que no, te, que no ha tenido casi ninguna educación formal, igual que el expresidente de Brasil y el actual presidente de Bolivia. Es autodidacta en español, se, se alfabetizó por su propia cuenta. En abril de 2009, con malicia abierta, un periódico de Lima publicó en primera plana los unos apuntes robados de la mesa de Hilaria Supa en el Congreso. Las, los apuntes estaban llenos de ortografía no estándar, de formas gramaticales típicas del español uh, andino y de, y de escritura no escolarizada. El editor del, pari, del periódico, Aldo Mariátegui, escribió una columna donde él también parece maniático, como que, que la, el, el duende de, la, de lingüística también se apoderó de él. Eh, voy a citarlo para que vean lo elaborado y lo, lo apasionado, y lo detallado está el retrato que pinta del área, de área supa a base de sus apuntes. Dice, pero no se puede pagar más de 20 mil soles al mes y darle tanto poder y responsabilidad a quienes no están mínimamente iluminados por las luces de la cultura. Pues aquí lo que se pone realmente en debate es si es sano para el país que pueda acceder al Congreso alguien con un nivel cultural tan bajo, está hablando de su ortografía, de un nivel cultural tan bajo, cuya ortografía y gramática revelan serias carencias y sin aparente ánimo de enmienda. Um, Oh, so in the, the, all the English isn't there. So he says, it's we, we, want, we need to know if it's healthy for the country that someone can, can reach Congress with such a, a such a low cultural level whose, whose spelling and grammar reveal such serious deficiencies and an apparent lack, uh, apparent absence of a desire for improvement, he says. He then goes, he does a, port a detailed portrait of what a person is like who has this problem with her spelling and grammar. Es indiscutible, sí está en inglés, ¿no? sí. es indiscutible que una persona con una instrucción tan, digamos, elemental, siendo generosos, poco puede aportar en la elaboración de leyes, en la fiscalización de casos complejos, en la reflexión diaria de hacia dónde debe ir la nave del Estado. O sea, es como yo, es como Santorum en Puerto Rico, ¿no? Es una cosa que se le fue la lengua. Una persona así posiblemente solo se va a limitar a repetir lugares comunes, a oponerse a todo solo por oponerse. 
etcétera, etcétera. No lo voy a leer todo, pero es, es un retrato detalladísimo que él construye desde su imaginación, desde su imaginario lingüístico colonial, ¿no? Concluye, por eso el voto debe ser voluntario y además debe haber requisitos extras para ser congresista con grado universitario, ¿ok? La crueldad y la agresión y la energía aquí revelan algo sobre la persistencia y la generatividad de la, de la, de la colonialidad hoy todavía en Perú y aquí también. La columna de Mariátegui desató aún más calor, pero no recibió la reacción que él esperaba. Los profesores de lingüística de la Universidad Católica de Lima lo condenaron como un acto de, de discriminación y violencia lingüística inaceptable en una sociedad democrática. Otro lingüista resignificó la historia. Veamos, la dijo, también como la huella de que algo extraordinario ha ocurrido. Se escribe español andino en el Congreso de la República. Emancipación. Hilaria misma respondió con energía y generatividad propia, en un discurso furibundo en el Congreso de la República, repudiando el maltrato que había recibido eh, y ahí y por los medios, condenando a la gente que no, no se da cuenta que somos una nación multicultural y plurilingüe, y condenando la mala fe monolingüista. ¿Quieres pasar? Ahí aparece en la, en la prensa popular. Señor presidente, dice, la lengua que hablo es el quechua, y no es una lengua de perros. Estoy segura que si un gringo viniera a hablar en este congreso, lo, ap lo aplaudirían por masticar el español. Elo ah, mala fe, ¿no? Más mala fe. Elogia su cultura, señala que fue una falla del Estado el hecho de que ella no pudiera estudiar. Exige una política de, de alfabetización bilingüe en español y en quechua. Exige reconocimiento de su capacidad de representar un sector importante de la sociedad peruana. Lo importante es que Supa hizo este discurso en el Congreso en quechua. Y aquí va el primer párrafo. Así se publicó en los periódicos. Termina diciendo que de aquí en adelante hará sus intervenciones en el Congreso en quechua y no en, en español. Y así hizo. Y por primera vez en la historia del Perú, el idioma quechua apareció en el Congreso como lengua de debate y, de, y lengua legis, legislativa, lo cual significó que los congresistas bilingües fueron los privilegiados, como aquí los, bilingües están, los oyentes bilingües son los privilegiados, y los monolingües, los, hablantes, los, los congresistas monolingües, que son prioritariamente de la élite, tuvieron que buscar intérpretes. Y los buscaron porque temían que ella hablara mal. De, she, they, they got interpreters because they were afraid she was speaking badly of them. Was, you know. Esta historia tiene una secuela que voy a contar al final. Pero aquí, aquí en, este, en este contexto, quiero recordar los esfuerzos que estamos enfrentando aquí para imponer pruebas de inglés como condición de acceso a la electoral, elector, electorabilidad aquí, también con blanco de hispanoparlantes. O sea, la colonialidad también está en juego en nuestro país. El, colonial, el colonialismo produce un multilingüismo estru, estructurado en relaciones de dominación y sub, subjugación. Cuando aparecen los colonizadores, la gente que encuentran se tornan indígenas, o sea, no son indígenas antes de que lleguen los colonizadores, ¿verdad? O, lo, o aborígenes, o sea, los que estuvieron aquí antes, donde el antes está definido por el colonizador que llega. En el marco colonial, los, las lenguas indígenas llegan a ser la manifestación incontrovertible de su continuidad histórica como pueblos. ¿verdad? que se extienden en el tiempo a través del antes y el después de la colonialidad. Settler colonialism, the kind that took place in the Americas and in other places like South Africa, Canada, produces societies 
that our multilingual force fields of conflict, collaboration, entanglement, coercion, assimilation, resistance, proximity, and distance, in which multiple social orders coming from multiple genealogies coexist, graft onto one another with new institutions and orders layered on top of uh, and interacting with and grafted onto things that were there before. It would be difficult to exaggerate the complexity of the entanglements that empire and colonialism have brought about in the United States and the heat that their friction has generated, particularly in this part of the country, in the Southwest. Here, what is now the border was already a border before Europeans came here. It was the Franja Norte, the northern fringe of the Aztec Empire that was based in central Mexico. It was the outer zone of its trades routes. It was inhabited by tribes they saw as untamed, Chichimeca. Under Spanish settler colonialism, this became a war zone between settlers and Indians. And after 1848, Anglo-American expansion layered over and grafted on to all of that, drawing a border which for many people had very little reality at all, and which for others operated as a defense line on the north against Anglo encroachment towards the south. The result, said, says Nicole Guidotti Hernandez in a recent article, was a war-based cross-border economy. The phrase resonates today. In a recent article in the recent edition of Social Text, Gudati Hernandez reconstructs the 1871 Camp Cramp massacre, um, which took place 70 miles away from here, mapping, trying to capture this complexity, mapping the interactions involved between men, women, between Mexicans, Tuxonenses, Anglos, indigenous people, that resulted in the massacre of 108 Aravaipa Apache Indians who had just surrendered after years of warfare against invading settlers. The war, that war-based cross-border economy and all its entanglements is still inhabits this space today and is booming, in fact, with the militarization now of the border in the north. Spanish in the southwest and all over the United States then inhabits multiple narratives as a language of the colonizer in relation to indigenous language, languages, the language of the colonized in relation to English, a language that belongs here, inhabits this landscape, is deeply embedded in it, and a language that arrives every day from other places in the migrant stream. In that frontier war zone, this frontier war zone, undocumented, undocumented migrants have become the Apaches, the insurrected, untamed, mobile, unsedentary forces to be eliminated at all costs. Three lines of empire converge here, along with two colonial regimes with all their baggage. Interminable, endless figure eights of migration in both directions as labor markets wax and wane, and the layering in of snowbirds, white migrants looking for sunshine and golf. A lot of frictions producing a lot of heat and a lot of golf. <laughs> Which is about water, right? We are indebted above all to the scholars of Mexican American studies and Native American studies, including many at this university, for producing the knowledge we need to grasp those, the frictions, the heat, and, the lar and their long histories here. When US society gets grounded in its own reality and its own history, that's when we we'll become a little less crazy around language. I said there was a sequel to the story of Hilaria Supa, y es esta. Hilaria Supa tuvo pronto que repensar su promesa de, de, de no usar el español en el Congreso peruano, porque se dio cuenta que necesitaba el español para forjar las alianzas políticas que necesitaba para llevar adelante sus proyectos legislativos. Regresó al español entonces, pero digo yo, no como, un lengu como, un, como la lengua imperial, sino como la lingua franca de su política, ¿verdad? como lingua franca. Donde hay multilingüismo, siempre hay, también habrá lenguas francas. Las, la, los segundos idiomas compartidos que permiten la comunicación a través de las diferencias lingüísticas. Donde hay imperio, 
el idioma imperial, la lengua del poder dominante, rápidamente dejará de pertenecer al poder imperial, como el inglés de, dejó hace mucho tiempo de pertenecer a Inglaterra o a Estados Unidos, y como el español rápidamente dejó de pertenecer a España. Los idiomas imperiales se convierten en las lenguas francas de los dominados, en los códigos por los cuales ellos exigen justicia o pactan la caída del imperio. Las lenguas francas son los medios por los cuales la idea, las ideas viajan, ¿no? viajan a mundos distantes. El español, por ejemplo, ha sido el, el factor crítico en la posibilidad de, del movimiento pan indígena en América Latina hoy, hoy es el código compartido que permite a los grupos de indígenas muy distantes de converger, de pactar, de, 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 llevar, de formar un movimiento. Valorizar el multilingüismo entonces significa también defender, significa obviamente defender las naciones plurilingües como el Perú, defender los derechos de los idiomas minoritarios, el acceso a la justicia y a la ley en cualquier idioma, la demanda por la educación y el crecimiento en una lengua materna. También creo que incluye un, un proyecto multilingüista, incluye acceso a las lenguas francas, no como un camino hacia la asimilación o la pérdida de lenguas maternas, sino como camino de acceso al poder cívico, a la conexión y a la alianza política. Y eso es otro reto, creo, para nuestro proyecto de multilingüismo uh, crítico. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Questions? English, Spanish, comentarios? Muchas gracias, equipo técnico. Muchas gracias, era excelente. Um, I would like to just now ask you a question, but maybe give you an additional example, because uh, in this region, prior to 1767, we had a huge movement or group, an organization called the Jesuit Missionaries, who represented really a very odd institution in the sense that many of them were actually German speakers, and they made the greatest efforts to learn the native languages. And they created dictionaries, they made the greatest efforts to preach in the native <laughs> languages and so forth. There were lots of it, uh, reasons why the Jesuits were later expelled, but I think one of the reasons was really that they worked extremely hard at multilingualism. You know, German speakers using Spanish as lingua franca and addressing local population in their own native languages. I suppose there were a lot of, a lot of jealousy and anger and fear on their part, and so they were all expelled. Just as yes, an that, that was true all, all over Latin America. In 1767, yes, exactly. the Jesuits were expelled everywhere. 1733. They, they yeah. were, um, one of the most famous cases is in, in Paraguay, right, where they had actually created utopian communities that were autonomous from the Spanish crown, and that was a big threat. So the, the Jesuits were easily, they were, a, a, became a huge political threat precisely because of this, these projects of forming autonomous um, indigenous speaking communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about your phrase, language pain, yeah. that you used near the beginning, and to say something more about what you meant by that. Why, in the case of somebody like Larry Summers, uh, pain and not, for example, shame? Maybe shame. Um, I'll tell you what I, because uh, you're right, language shame is another, another thing, and there was a part of this lecture that had to be deleted because it was too long, but it was about that, and, working with um, Gustavo Perez Firmat's book, Mother, Mother T or Tongue Tied, in which he talks about what it means to not be a fluent speaker of your mother tongue. And he said there's, no, there's nothing more disabling, is what he just, he's speaking of his relation to Spanish. Language pain, um, 
you know, where I first came to this concept was actually through a linguist named Patricia Pat Nichols, who taught at San Jose State. And she was teaching um, sociolinguistics, and she did a study with her students. Um, San Jose is an extraordinarily linguistically and ethnically diverse part of the country. And she had students write, uh, go and write language histories for themselves in which they went back to see how far back do you go in your family till you find, till you hit someone who is not a native speaker of English. And that was all she wanted to know was the generational thing. What surprised her completely was the stories the students came back with when they had gone to their grandparents or their parents or the people or their other relatives and asked about this, the stories, the, the stories of loss suddenly came out and the students had, had never had heard this. And they began to hear this tremendous amount of regret, not from everybody. There's lots of people who feel like, thank God I got rid of this language that nobody speaks, you know, and I'm, but, there, but the stories of language loss, and it was particular about the inability of, of the difficulty of communication between grandparents and grandchildren that kept coming up in these. So Pat, Pat Nichols, this was just something that surprised her and came out, and that's when she began to study that. And it was her work that first took me to the idea of language pain. And I've come to feel that it's, um, it's not that everybody who, who, every family where there's a language loss has to be diagnosed as having some patholo a psychic pathology because of it. That would be, I mean, that would be, we'd be a much crazier na nation than we are now if that were true. So, but, um, but I do think it's an, un there's a lot of unprocessed uh, grief and sadness and things that, com that comes up from time to time uh, when you ask people about it. So that's what I meant by language pain. And the shame part is a whole other thing that, um, that, it, what, that, that people will tell you about from their childhoods and particularly the, the school experiences and that kind of thing. But I thank you for making the distinction. It's very valuable. Claire. I want to go back to the to your notion of lingua franca because, of course, uh, this is the topic. Um, how do you envisage um, transforming not only uh, Spanish in, in this particular case as a lingua franca, as a mediating language, but a lot of the foreign languages that we teach, we might also consider teaching them as lingua franca. I'm thinking of French, German. I mean, they're the big languages. The European languages are already uh, sort of lingua francas. They are, however, very much more than English, marked culturally, historically, etc. So how do you envisage um, teaching those languages as lingua franca? Does that mean um, depriving them of their cultural historicity, making them into uh, these, this kind of uh, mediating code? I mean, how should we think of this? I think it, it involves teaching them in their multiplicity. I don't know a single French class that actually, maybe they exist, I hope they exist, where you, where, where you, you learn what Quebec French sounds like, what, what African French, Frenches sound like. It would be teaching them in the multiplicity, which is what enables them to operate as lingua francas. What lingua francas work because of that, d that infinite elasticity of comprehension, right? Lingua francas can be franca, because you can speak you know, American English and comprehend the English spoken by someone who speaks it completely differently from you, where every single vowel is different, right? And it's that, so lingua francas can be franca can, because of that elasticity of comprehension, so that you are able to understand uh, the language in when, it, in, in when it is spoken in forms that are extremely di di diverse, di different from one another. That, to me, is the, wh one of the reasons why, if I were refounding linguistic theory, that distinction between the elas that elasticity of comprehension in comparison with the, the narrowness of speech, that distinction would be the central axis of, of my foundational linguistic theory if I were starting from scratch. So that's what I think is, if you want to teach the lingua franca, English is a lingua franca, teach as many Englishes as, as you can to, so that you people then grasp the incredible diversity of it and at the same time, the comprehensibility. So that would be my ideal utopian. I don't know how that would look in the drawing. We'll have to figure that out. <laughs> I need a graphic on it. 
Hi, Mary. It's great to have you here. And uh, I recognize my training in <laughs> your presentation. So um, <laughs> Miranda has me in her past, <laughs> along with a lot of other people. <laughs> but I'm I mean, and parts of the, the parts that jump out as, oh, I learned the way I think somewhere is your discussion of the ways that uh, both political ideologies, liberalism, um, shape the ideologies about language and the practices of languages are structured by capitalist dynamics. Um, so I'm curious what the implications are on both of those dimensions for the vision you articulate at the end of um, the kinds of political practices of alliance using lingua francas. Um, is there a kind of economic vision implied as well in that? An economic, um, you know, I don't think so, but did you see one or hear? <laughs> What's, I'm trying to figure out what, I think I need you to say what you had, what came to mind. Well, I mean, I think a little piece of it is that I'm thinking about the relation, what are the, what are the structures of relationship? I mean, if a, if Saussure's vision is of these completely um, abstract liberal subjects, mm -hmm. except that they're not really abstract, they're really quite particular, mm -hmm. what are the, what are the subjects who build alliances? What what kind of political vision ah. are the subjects who build alliances by using a lingua franca, which still implies you know hier hierarchies or differences or something? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That I see what you're saying, um, and I think that I don't think there's an answer to that question, but I think that whenever <coughs> group, whenever pe people from disparate positions or places use a link, come together under a lingua franca, um, one of the things that happens is, it, for example, with the indigenous movement in Latin America, it's, it's really uh, quite, very quite elaborated practices have been developed so that, that Spanish becomes a lingua franca. Every group also to a meeting must bring performance. Everyone has to bring performance as a, as a group and everyone has to become, bring, bring dress. So Supa is there in her dress. Everyone has to bring dress. So there's a set of, of customs and practices developed around the marking of differences in the context of the, of the sameness. So I think this is where thinking about language separate from the physical is really, like in that context, is just completely weird. You know, because the, ex the whole thing, the expressive, practice is, is, is very much interpenetrated with, the, with language, with performance, and with dress, and also with other things like pr practice for eating. So I guess that's where I would go with that. But it's a very, very, it's a very stimulating question. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, uh, just talking a bit about Teddy Roosevelt. Um, the quote that you showed a little while later, he uses the phrase, uh, America should not become a polyglot boarding house. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. That fits, yeah, it fits very well into your analysis because it means that multilingualism is poverty. Right? He equates it with poverty. It also means a boarding house, like you don't really live here, right? You don't oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you're absolutely. not a property owner, yeah. you're only here temporarily. <laughs> so that's great. I, I and then, of course, in 1919, he wrote The Winning of the West, six volume work. Um, where he sees the Anglo-Saxon uh, conquest of the West as a continuation of um, the, um, the German expulsion of the Romans from Ger Germania. You know, this is all one big um, Nordic triumph. Do you know, do you know that well, I saw that Drockton resurge in the, 19, uh, in the 1980s when um, I actually started researching the writings of Augusto Pinochet when he was dictator of Chile. And I started writing an essay called The Complete Works of Augusto Pinochet. And <laughs> he wrote because Pinochet wrote a textbook for a military school called Geopolitics, Geopolitica. And I found this book, and it was written in the, in the, in the 60s, right? But it was a textbook for military schools in, um, in, Ch in Chile, and that was the, that was the project. That, that Chile was an extension of the, the
the Prussian Empire and the I mean, it was anyway that it traveled the paradigm. <laughs> Also, if it's okay, just n one other observation. Um, in the, the, the program I, that you, you map out, you so nicely map out, it's already there in uh, Nebrija's uh, grammar, in his preface, where he tells Isabella, the, the Romans conquered everything, and they had good grammar, so here's a grammar for you, so you can go out and conquer. And, <laughs> and it's really interesting. Yes, it, it seems, this is something about empires that really intrigues me, that it, it seems like, when a, a, when an empire is formed, when a, a when a state is about to become imperial, it it tries to unify itself internally, homogenize itself internally. So Nebrija's grammar, and he's the one who says famously that grammar is the greatest instrument of empire, right? In 1492, and that's when he writes the first formal grammar of Spanish. To and and so there's a strange connection. The same with Teddy Roosevelt. He was presiding over the transition of the U.S. into becoming an imperial power, which really 1898, right? And and so the hom the internal homogenizing seems partly that seems like another dimension of it. The other example is France, where the f the first French formal grammar is, is called the Port Royal Grammar. What's the name of the first French city founded in the United States? Port Royal, Montreal. Right? So it's 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 an interesting kind of phenomenon that I don't quite understand, but it just seems to be there. Yes, and then what Michael said this morning is that it, it wasn't the, ca the case that everybody in, in the country in the imp speaks it. I mean, Castilian was not spoken by, uh, was spoken by a very small number of Spaniards in 1492, right? So it's, it's, it's something about the codification that is part of the imaginary that you have to set up. It's really a kind of interesting fact, yeah. Yes. A French grammar, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should be universal, right? <laughs> I I didn't say that, but you did. <laughs> it's being said, <laughs> right? We have these microphones because this is being streamed somewhere, I guess, mm -hmm. huh? It's out in the... Yeah, I did. Okay, good. Hi, thanks. Um, absolutely brilliant analysis, um, and I just enjoyed it so much. But I want to maybe push a little harder follow-up on Claire's question about what it takes to turn an imperial language into a language of wider, into a lingua franca. Mm -hmm. um, and since you mentioned the example of Castilian and the limited circulation of it uh, initially in the peninsula, um, I wanted to think about um, the Spanish case, where yes, you have, I mean, uh, contemporary Spain. So you have recognition of the autonomies and the autonomous languages, but Spain is still relentlessly centrally monolingual. Um, you still have a group that identifies itself monolingually as the owners of the Spanish language, regardless of their rec kind of. They kind of fell into an imperial nostalgia, and they went on this campaign to create this international campaign to make 1492 a celebration of the Spanish Empire. And the, the theme was El Encuentro de Dos Culturas, the encounter of two cultures. This in Latin America became a j hilarious joke. There were all these t-shirts, you've probably seen them, of um, a llama spinning on a conquistador and it says El Encuentro de Dos Culturas. <laughs> but more important, it was that. It was that campaign in 1491 where Spain tried to reclaim the empire. That's what galvanized the indigenous movement. And the, in, 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 eight, in, in 1991, the first encounter of indigenous groups from all over South America happened in Quito. And they produced a declaration called the Declaración de Quito in Spanish. And it was the first time they came together, and it was the reaction against the, the, the new imperial gesture that galvanized that thing. So it was really in interesting, um, what I say about just the way the force field it has this, a lot of generative power, you know, all these centuries later. Um, to me? 
saw a hand back there and a hand up here earlier. Where's the mic? Uh, I was so intrigued by your joke in your title. Um, you know, if English was good enough for Jesus, I, I teach in a very small college and the Bible Belt. And please don't tell me someone actually said it. <laughs> well, in my neighborhood, in my regular community, people say that kind of stuff all the time. In the seminary where I teach, people say, "Well, if Latin was good enough for Jesus, then I must study Latin, and we must say the Mass in Latin." And I say, "Son, <laughs> scholars are almost unanimous that he didn't speak Latin." And they say, "But." He heard Latin during his lifetime at least, so maybe he knew it, you know? And, and so I, I guess I'm wondering about the, maybe some of the pedagogical implications or some of your thoughts on that kind of stuff, like, you know, for um, language education, multilingualism, and different kind of educational settings, and where, where you think we're headed. <laughs> What the question, what's the, what's the question I mean, again? just, you know, I'm just wondering about, you know, um, any thoughts that you might have on, um, you know, pedagogical pedagogy and, and ignorance on issues of language and language education and yeah. multilingualism and where we're maybe, you know, headed with, um, you know, where do we start in a very, you know, monolingual society where any kind of language that's seen as other is probably seen as, you know, oh, this is Jesus's language or something. You know, there's just, just tremendous ignorance and I, I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, in the particular religious question, you might, if you can bear, if you can bring yourself to, I got really interested in, in uh, Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, in the linguistics of it, because it's, it's this film about the, pa of the death of Jesus, and there's no, English, there's no English in it at all, right? And it's made in Latin and, Ara in, and Aramaic and Hebrew. And uh, it's interesting to watch it, because the, 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 the mo there are two people in the, in the film who are multilingual, and the one who speaks everybody's language to them is Jesus. He's the, most, he's the multilingual guy. And the result is when he's crucified in the film, the the sign above his cross is in three languages. It's in Eng Hebrew, Latin. <laughs> it's in all the languages, right? Uh, so there's a whole really interesting linguistic thing going on there about about uh, Chris Christianity and the originarian languages. You know, I think with pedagogically, um, Chile and John Warnock are here. They were here, and I remember when the we they invited us once to participate in a college composition um, summer institute that they ran in Wyoming, and we were asked to give a talk about multiculturalism. This is a long time ago when that was the big debate. And I remember we, we had a group of students in our class. This was Renato Rosando and myself. And we were kind of like, it, they were all Anglo-Americans. And we thought, oh gosh, how are we going to start with multiculturalism? And the people who lived in Laramie, Wyoming said, you know, we can't, there's nothing we can do here with multiculturalism because there's, it, it's all, we're all the same here, right? Well, on the main street in Laramie, Wyoming, there was a Spanish language video store. That Laramie was full of multilingualism. It was full of Spanish speakers. It was full of, and they, but it was like you're trained. The problem is not that it's not there. It's that you are trained not to see it. You are trained not to hear it. And in our group of students that were all, all Anglo-Americans, we went around and asked people their stories. And what we, we walked, we w later we said we watched the dissolution of the white synthesis. Everybody had a story. People had, People were from families who'd, who'd moved to Russia after the, uh, after the war, after World War II. Fam people who'd gone off in Mexico and came back. People who'd been Quakers and missionaries. So there was just this vast diversity, heterogeneity within the group. And so I think in the U.S., one of the things in a classroom here that you do is you find, you find that you find the diversity in the classroom. You get people to find their own story, go back and 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 um, and and the syn try and get the synthesis to dissolve. You know, and then. Then you have something to work with that's people's own historical experience. You know, one of the things that Pat Nichols found in her research that was so interesting, and it's, it's so obvious when you think about it, but if you ask yourself, what is the ethnic group that has been speaking English the longest in the United States? It's African Americans. That's who's been, the, has had English because of the whole condition under which African American society was founded in the United States out of, out of the lingua franca, right? So, that, I guess pedagogically, that's sort of my idea. Get started with what's around you. There are there are very most communities in the United States now have po immigrant populations of some kind in them, and that so people are not in in quite the same kind of bubbles that we think. We see a bubble, and then you just have to find where it where it's got a leak in it.
<laughs> Fortunately, we are running out of time. We have one more section to go before we break for the evening. Please help, thank, help, me, help me thank Mary Louise Pratt for the talk today. Before I forget as well, we also like to thank Dr. Michael Holkus for his talk, who we both would like to thank together, because the conversation that's ensuing now is taking stock of their arguments, taking stocks of their thoughts, so that we can provide some kind of intellectual roadmap or plot line that we can perhaps trace the rest of the symposium. So the goal of today, of course, if you want to, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, now that we have you here, we would like what we would like to do is to open the floor for discussion and um, and to see if um, you would like to discuss or put on table some of the issues that might have arisen during the the talks, or um, wh where you see the conversation going from here, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the things that we are going to ask you to do is when you speak, maybe to kindly introduce yourselves uh, so that we know whom we are addressing, since it is going to be an audience addressing each other. Um, but first, let's ask our uh, speakers if there is anything else. I'm sure you're tired, but if there's anything else you may want to add to, uh, or you may want to begin with, uh, such a plan, no? Thank you. And that is why you're all here. So again, we're not asking questions to someone anymore. We're asking it to each other. I, I'm taking a big risk here, speaking off to these great, great speakers. Um, one thing that I missed in, in Professor Holker's talk one thing that fascinated me was the assumption that the truth of language would somehow filter through and have an effect and bring reason uh, into debates on language. And, and you confess to not being a public intellectual. Um, and I suspect there's, there's a misconnect there, that, that, that some other kind of, of, of reasoning has to be in play. Now, in, in Europe, uh, language debates would not operate as far as I can see, in, in the way you've presented it here and, and, and uh, in the Americas for, for Professor Pratt's talk, um, we do have a claim to, to uh, linguistic rights, language rights, often based on territoriality, on occupation of a certain space over time. So it's not an abstract argument about the uh, nature of language. As, as, as it, it's a matter of who's been here the longest. And this, as, as you pointed out, is being used to construct multilingualism to defend the European languages and not provide language services to immigrants, which is something I'm, I'm very concerned with uh, at the moment, personally. Now, that territoriality uh, surely is operative in, in debates about language policy here, although it hasn't been mentioned. That's why I'm pick, picking it up. And I suspect it might be operative in this very brave and still troubling defense of the lingua franca, of the imperial language as a lingua franca. And I've been grappling with that. Why, why does that bother me as a concept? Um, and I, th I, I think it bothers me because uh, I, I can imagine how do you say, linguas francas, lingua francas, um, that have had no territoriality, and, and for which, if they were lost, uh, there would be no pain. Uh, I used to speak one, I still speak a bit, fanicolo. It's a, it's a, it's a pidgin language used in mining in, in southern Africa. Absolutely, just for, for uh, giving orders, actually, it's not a past to civic power, it's just pure power. Uh, Happy to have lost that one, absolutely. And it's gradually in the mining industry giving way to English. English is encroaching on that, but hey, you know, that one was pure uh, imperial domination. Uh, it was a language with imperatives. Uh, and, and language at least uh, <laughs> allows a, a bit, bit, bit more. And you were talking here about Spanish being used between indigenous groups. So it's not anyone's L1. 
I assume, it doesn't have territorial claims. It's just language of convenience as a lingua franca is in its classical definition. What bothers me is that it is also the imperial language, as was pointed out, also has uh, enormous asymmetries uh, into it. And I, I still remain unconvinced that we can obviate that, forget about it, forget about those asymmetries, forget about some people who do actually use it better, more convincingly, more with more fluency, with greater ease than others, and who do have some claim to territoriality. So that, that's the one thing I'd like to raise that, that I missed in both talks and might connect them in some way. Um, I no, I, I think it's 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 very helpful to rethink the the question of the. It, it's too simple to say that the lingua franca has just stopped being imperial, uh, but I want to go back to territoriality because in the U.S. one of the most interesting things to me that I did, and it's another piece that I had to pull out, but. Um, the, the it, Europe, it's very, the contrast between Europe and the United States is really interesting. In, in it, Europe is held up in the U.S. all the time as the model for multilingual education. But Europe, in, in the policies in Europe are that you do not teach immigrant languages, or that has been the policy. There's a certain amount of change now, but immigrant languages, everyone in Europe has to learn languages, but not immigrant languages. Whereas in the U.S., it's only about, the debates are almost entirely about immigrant languages. Now the other thing in the U.S. that's really different is that the one place where multilingualism is recognized as absolutely a, a given feature of this society is the court system. And, and in the U.S. you are entitled to, to legal representation. If you are, if you are the, the court, the federal government w will only fund any, will only fund courts, state and local courts that uh, provide free language services for everyone in court. And there it's, there's things like in, in Nebraska last year, Nebraska spent a million and a half dollars on court interpreters in 70 languages. So there's, and this is happening in communities all over. It's putting incredible strains on budgets in local communities because the increase in the numbers of languages that they have to provide interpreters in, and of course there's all kinds of flaws in the system and people waiting months for their case to come up because the one guy who is a legal interpreter in Marshallese is doing a case in North Carolina and you're waiting for him in Kentucky. I mean, it's like that. But it's really interesting that as far as I can tell in the U.S., across the whole political spectrum, I have yet to hear anyone seriously questioning that as a right, that language right here. And you would think, you would think that the monolingualist ideology would lead people to say, forget it. If you don't know English, you're not entitled to legal representation. Tough luck. And so far, that's not happening here at all. And it sounds like there's a contrast there that it, I don't know if Europe is willing to put, is, has the same um, requ requirement for legal representation. I can answer that. Uh, European law says that each defendant in criminal proceedings has a right to an interpreter in a language he or she understands textually. So it's not maternal language, it's not L1, but it's one they understand. Um, the strains are enormous um, because many non-professional interpreters are necessarily employed because we have no training in those languages. Uh, so in Spain we get comic cases of, uh, you know, the, the accused was the only interpreter available. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and one police... <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, and, and one... Uh, one interpreter was sent to an encounter at, at, the, uh, at the police and was promptly arrested because he was on their uh, list of wanted people. You know. But um, it's a disconnect between the, the demands, which, are, which are, are palpable, and, and the state uh, training institutions have done nothing to, to train people in these languages. Same problem. I mean, the, the same... There's no official, official policy for hospitals, but it's working that way. So where I, I, I live in Spain, sorry, my name's Anthony Penn. Um, um, hospitals in our area, um, we have, you know, um, Maghreb, Maghreb, um, immigrants from Maghreb. Uh, we have Arabic and French for them. Okay. From Senegal, we have French. Uh, it's just too much to ask to, to get any closer languages. Excuse me, I have a question in the back. So that, that's your lingua franca, yeah? French in the hospital, but I guess it's...
And they seem to have no problem with that. And in fact, they point to this as a marker of either the colony or, in the nation, cosmopolitanism and sophistication. Uh, I want to pick up a little bit about what Anthony started to talk about. Um, my name is Barbara Costa. I'm in the Department of German Studies here at the University of Arizona. And uh, about, uh, well, the lingua franca. And I'm thinking of, I have two kind of stories in my mind that maybe illustrate the power differentials of different speakers that may be speaking a common language coming to it, you know, from um, maybe different language groups, but speaking a common language. And um, I'm thinking of, for example, in the German context, there are uh, German writers of Turkish heritage. And when they write creatively, oftentimes I've heard uh, Ger native German speakers saying that they do not properly use the language. So that there's a, there's a power structure between those who, who have a language as their native language and those who are non-native language speakers. So I'm wondering that lingua franca, you know, it's, it doesn't seem like it's, um, there's a certain power structure that may be implied in that too and I'm thinking of um, a, a kind of a personal story as well. <clears throat> and that is, I grew up with, um, my mother is Austrian, my father is Serbian. And I remember one day as a teenager, I was really angry with my father and my grandmother who are Serbian speakers. And I said to them, you know, we're a family of sinkers and tinkers. Could somebody please think around here? <laughs> <laughs> So invoking that, I'm the native speaker, and even though we're all speaking English, you're not really speaking English. Um, Tom Recento, University of Calgary. Uh, <clears throat> one comment following up on the American situation. I, I believe American was first used for uh, Native Americans. When they spoke about Americans, it was Native Americans. It wasn't what we come to think of as quintessentially the opposite or, or different or white European provenance. So that whole history of labeling is something that would surprise a lot of people today. And following up on this notion of lingua franca, which is something I've been looking at a lot and um, thinking about, there's a book by Philip Van Perry, who's a Belgian bilingual guy, political theorist, sort of economist. He's written a book called Linguistic Justice for Europe and the World. He's got this grand scheme. This is the book for people who are into economics and metrics. He has a lot of uh, mathematical uh, formulations. His idea is that everyone should learn English. It'll help lead to a, a demos, a global demos necessary for economic justice. But I think what's missing in the analysis and is relevant to these comments that have been made is that there is always a symmetry. And he, he acknowledges this between people who are native English speakers, for example, in Europe and those who aren't. There are just simply are inequalities uh, in terms of uh, ability to manipulate, uh, use the language uh, in particular ways. He says that the free riders, the Anglophone countries, should subsidize. He's got a big scheme how this would work. They should subsidize the teaching and learning of English as a necessary sort of remedy. The point is, the backdrop of this, as has been mentioned, is global neoliberalism. In other words, the hope for a situation where there would be uh, the, the sort of solidarities and, and, and you want to use, call it cosmopolitan or communitarian you know, um, um, uh, possibilities for thwarting the dynamics 
which uh, favor, for example, a very small number of highly trained workers who speak particular languages, like English in Ireland, where there are 100,000 English you know, people working for American-owned companies because they speak English, um, is, is to really have a, a fundamental huge change in the whole world order. So in other words, the, there's two So there's two things. One is there's always asymmetries. Himes talked about this in 85. Even if there were a revolution, there's still going to be asymmetries among languages and speakers of languages. But secondly, in the world order today, it's hard to take out of the equation the, mean, the mechanisms and structures and institutions and processes which render certain sorts of languages and, and, and sec sectors of the uh, labor force as having favored privileged um, you know, value uh, without talking in, in great depth about the economic situation and the economic political situation. So for example, lingua francas, people have written about the way for more local development is uh, using local lingua francas to develop local resources and um, industries that would require lingala or something, let's say, uh, in that context in the Republic of the Congo or something. Be because th uh, that's where most of the growth and the possibility for economic development is happening. It's much more, the informal economy is, is like, I think the figure is like 100 times more than all of the aid that has been given to uh, low-income countries uh, in the last century is by local economy. So local economy needs local, local lingua franca. So I'm, I'm saying lingua franca can work, but it's not necessarily English or the colonial ones. Uh, but even there, they're going to be asymmetries. So they're always going to be asymmetries, but the underlying situation with the socio-political uh, framing that creates asymmetries more broadly in terms of distribution uh, of, glo of resources and investment and you know, World Bank and all that stuff is, is sort of the big, is it the elephant in the room? So that sounds good, but even Von Puri, if you read his book, it's very impressive except I think it doesn't really deal with why would people want to do this? Why is the United States going to subsidize the teaching and learning of English around the world? What's, and why, would, why does Pfizer want to make AIDS drugs cheaper in Africa? They don't. Okay, uh, the Africans can make AIDS drugs much cheaper, but they have no vested interest in it. We can go on and on and on, but there's this very complex framework which is relevant to this. We can't isolate languages in this way, I think. So, so, what are you saying? Is that I mean, all the money that OUP puts in uh, in in uh, the um, <laughs> the development of uh, of English as a lingua franca in Vienna, et cetera, et cetera, uh, should it uh, is it money that should be better spent not developing a lingua franca and uh, and developing strategies for multilingualism? Uh, I mean. <laughs> A very small percentage of Europeans are mobile across b uh, borders in terms of the linguistic and educational skills that give them social mobility across European state borders. So there is a class of jet setters and people with lots of skills who will benefit from Oxford English. But most of the people, that, you know, Filipino maids in Hong Kong, we can go on and on. In other words, uh, the, the amount of benefit for English worldwide, given the number of jobs there are and the number of, uh, in the workforce, and the number of people who work for multinationals who could use English, the number of that latter group is tiny, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. Yeah. So there's a perception we have as the jet setters that uh, we need a, to add a few more jet setters, but it's not really helping the, it's not helping this, the very poor countries, low income con countries. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. Um, so um, Randall Halla from the University of Pittsburgh. And, um, I, I think it's important that we're underscoring the relationship of language, economy, and, and politics here. I think that's very important. I do um, not want to be the person who um, protects the empire, um, or promotes imperialism, but I do think actually there's something to be said about those empires and those empires. And I do think we might want to consider the way that um, certain uh, questions of um, modernization, standardization, efficiency, governmentality, have operated differently across different empires historically. And I can think 
about um, Central Europe uh, and especially the Polish territories under the control on the one hand of Germanifying forces um, versus the, um, I'm, I'm just sort of tossing this out, I'm sorry to, to put this in the mix, but um, what uh, uh, in the Russian Empire, one of the things that I know of linguistic politics was that at first there was a move towards Russification, but um, that withdrew into an attempt to standardize especially the Yiddish speakers. And out of that, then, the initial grammars um, for Yiddish uh, helped generate the flourishing of a Yiddish literature, uh, which is lost uh, on a certain level. I mean, that, that, that speaking of that, that standardized and the, the production of that literature. But I do think that that's important for us to recall in some ways that there are ways in which empires are not uh, simply uh, 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 exercises of um, monolingualism, but can also be uh, uh, structures which, which, for various reasons, can can promote a kind of linguistic diversity and 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 facilitate that. Uh, okay, I'm David Gramling from uh, German Studies here at the University of Arizona. Um, I, we're all professors, everyone who has been is presenting the next couple of days, so our positions in this whole uh, discussion are, are interesting in terms of what our responsibilities are at our individual universities. Um, my assignment is 40% research, 40% teaching, 20% service, and so what I'm wondering is, you know, Mary Louise Pratt just gave us a great example of producing research and, and, and service in a language other than English. And so what I'm wondering is, you know, as we all consider hiring um, uh, in the future of the humanities and, and the idea that 13% uh, of those who do the teaching in uh, at a U.S. university right now are uh, latter-ranked faculty, is are those who carry the rank of professor uh, responsible for producing research and service in a language other than than English, um, and to what extent would would you consider that a criterion for hiring the new generation of uh, of, of of professors, um, whether or not they're native speakers or or non native speakers or whatever else we call them? So I think I was just inspired by what um, Mary Louise Pratt did today as an example of a type of research that often doesn't get done or an, uh, among. Uh, those of us whose first language is English, um, and yet we teach in other in other languages. So, you, it, that usually focuses around teaching, but not so much in in terms of research or service. So, I wonder if anybody has any uh, comments about that. Okay. Well, um, we, so at my university, we so here's what's going on with all of the influx of Chinese. Indian and other students from other parts of the world who may not speak English. So you can spend a lot of money and time giving them ESL, which, as we know, can be tricky depending on what the background has been. Or you can teach a class taught in Chinese, Engineering 101 in Chinese. And that's what institutions uh, like mine are, are doing. How about that? That's turning it right on the head, hey? Now, you'd think that the FAIR and the U.S. English people would be down on that, like. Uh, well, you pick your metaphor, but uh, so, I mean, frankly, to be quite honest, if we're talking about the metric or of efficiency, what's more efficient? If you got a class of students that you can make up of speaking non-English languages, this is what's happening in the other way in Europe, right? They claim in Sweden and Denmark and some other countries, degrees and programs are being offered in English, and there's great fear that those really, we don't think of Swedish as being threatened, or I guess finish, um, but there are claims that those languages are threatened because things are going the way of English, so why not? How open are we to that? Then that really you know, makes us say, well, how willing are we to consider something as seemingly quite off the beaten track? Um, you know, as so I throw that out as an example. Uh, I've argued for that for a long time with, with on deaf ears often.
um, Albrecht class and also here at the Department of German Studies. Um, I would like to come back to my very first question um, this early afternoon and try to broaden this a little bit. I wonder really why we do not have more multilingualism, why we don't have more professors or departments where just all kinds of languages are being spoken. And I would like to throw out a term that might illustrate this quite well. The term is shibboleth. You might have heard about it. It's already in the Old Testament. It was used in 14th century Poland, in 15th century Sweden, and I think 16th century Holland. Shibboleth meant whoever doesn't speak the language of the people properly was killed. And that's what we see often on our computers. We have a computer error, shibboleth. Why do I bring this up? You know, let's say there's a statement in Polish and anyone who couldn't speak that sentence properly was regarded non-Polish, hence German, hence was killed. It was part of a war. So I wonder really, I mean, it's an extremely interesting and for me thought-provoking and fertile conference, but at the same time, I'm really worried that we are missing out also a little bit the political dimension because we face e enormous resistance in the public. We have heard a number of very good examples I think we also have to address a fundamental uh, degree of fear, naked fear of a large section of our population, whether this is the white Anglo population or whatever, they are afraid. They do not speak Spanish. They are afraid. Same thing, let's say in Germany. Germans are afraid. Too much English is coming in. Or the French, whatever. There is fear. I think we have to face this that the entire fascinating, really, for us as intellectuals, most productive and far-reaching process of multilingualism causes enormous fear, has always caused fear, and has been used even as a political instrument to kill the other side. So I would like just to appeal to all of us just to keep that a little bit in mind, because why do we study this phenomenon of uh, multilingualism? In order to develop also practical strategies to defend, and to help, to empower the next generation to understand a little bit the productivity and the, and the creativity and the foresightedness of multilingualism. But I think most people are mon monolingual speakers and they're afraid and jealous, envious, or angry about multilingual speakers. Or xenophobic. I wanted to add one more to your list. I also wanted to add that it might not be fear against multilinguals, it's fear against a wrong kind of monolingual. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's... One more question? You have a question, yeah. sir? <laughs> we, have, we have two minutes. Just respond to what David first said and then what Albrecht uh, said. There is, a, a, or there is a political, a very important political dimension here uh, that goes beyond, beyond language, especially the way Americans use the word language. Right? I, I've discussed this with some of you already, but um, Americans think that, for instance, uh, Albrecht, you, you, you're a professor of German studies, right? Uh, that Albrecht grants degrees in German nouns and verbs, right? That's what people think. Uh, those of you who teach in other languages in the United States grant degrees in languages, right? And all of the ideas go on in literature in the English department, right? English means literature, okay? Um, now th this is connected to this problem, okay? It is a political issue. It's a form of protectionism, okay? Content gets expressed in English. Um, French, German, Arabic, whatever, these are tools used to gather knowledge and bring it back into English. Okay? Um, one of the ways around this, for all of, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to sound imperious here, but for, <laughs> for all of you who teach in things that people call languages, okay, which we in Europe understand very, very differently, okay, we don't understand, um, you know, uh, we don't understand uh, French as uh, as simply the, simply the language, but the, the culture and, and everything else involved with it. Um, you, you have to find ways to get your administrators to understand the content of what you're doing, okay? Um, that
that students need to know how to manipulate content in something other than English. And it's not a it's not a language skill that is the, that, that's the tool. Okay, it's um, it's the the end result. Okay, um, and then uh, the, what the gentleman you were saying about teaching um, actually teaching engineering in Chinese. Uh, I'm sorry, in the United States, right? Um, I think that you know that's that's the that, that may be an extreme example, but getting students to the point where they're operational in these other languages. Right? Also, um, getting yourselves recognized as, not as, as noun and verb teachers, but as um, historians of the German Baroque era, okay? Um, or um, French art historians who teach in French departments. Right? And then tell the administration that if you have somebody teaching French art history, who doesn't know French, your university is fraudulent. We need people who can do research in these fields in languages other than English. Okay? And you, you guys got a real, a real big fight on your, on, uh, in front of you because at the administration, uh, as soon as you say German, as soon as you say French, as soon as you say Italian or language, they think nouns and verbs. Okay? You got to find ways to change that. I saw a hand up here. This, this may be the last comment, I'm sorry. Oh, well, yeah, so when I got my PhD, you had to have two languages in it. So, okay, first thing in our mind, right? We don't require languages of our doctoral students. At universities, right, at the University of Texas at San Antonio, we got rid of a language requirement. Well, if you get rid of it at the university, you get rid of it in high school. I mean, there's no more direct way to influence language foreign language learning, and I know we're talking about nouns and verbs, but we've got to have that too, than saying you don't have to take it, right? I think at Ivy League schools it's still uh, a good thing to do, but I don't, I don't think it's, I heard the president, I think it was Yale, saying we expect people to have three years of foreign language, but other than maybe a few select schools that I know of, maybe at Arizona, you don't need to have foreign language. So how can we expect there to be the kind of interest in even the broader issue of culture if we don't even have people studying any foreign language. Last few comments. Last few comments and we will wrap. The, the problem, sir, the problem is not with the foreign languages. The problem is with the English language departments that believe that everything can be said in English and everything can be researched in English. And the fact that uh, art history or, or some topic uh, could be discovered in the French language and say things that the English colleagues would not know because the English language doesn't have access to that knowledge is anathema to English departments that teach uh, foreign literatures in English. We have one more comment, and we really have to wrap it up. Please. I, I just wanted to um, mention that I, I think multilingualism in the U.S. university systems is becoming the providence of the elite. I'm at the uh, City University of New York. I'm a product of the um, California State University System and University of California System. And I think in um, both the CSU and we just fought this fight in CUNY, uh, exactly what was mentioned is happening. Um, we fought a tremendous fight for foreign language, some kind of requirement to be preserved under a big curriculum reform. And we were, for the large part, unsuccessful. It will be uh, preserved piecemeal within the CUNY system. And it's been brought up by my colleagues that this is, frankly, racist because of the population of our, um, our student population will be deprived of that. Now, of course, we have a huge population of immigrant language speakers, but they're 
at the heritage language level and they're being lost by third generation. And so, uh, yeah, sure, at the Ivy Leagues, there's still language requirements, but it's definitely, I would echo um, Professor Ricento, it's definitely in the public university system on, on the way down, and we keep fighting. We had um, members of the MLA write these eloquent letters to the chancellor of the CUNY system, mostly to no avail. <clears throat> well, once again, thank you everybody for attending. Our next event is seven o'clock tonight at Casa Vicente. And we are hopeful that everything that we didn't get to talk about today will be talked about on Saturday and Sunday. Thank you. Good night.